This is Laura Candler, and I am so excited to be here with Angela Watson as my guest today for a really special presentation called Teachers You Are a Priority To, How to Create Simple Habits of Rest and Self-Care That Will Change Your Life. Now, you might think that that's a kind of a lofty title. And um, I might have thought, wow, that's a that's a you know, that's going to be pretty tough to deliver. Um, but to tell you the truth, Angela does it just beautifully. Um, I attended this presentation last night. It was our first live um, presentation of this webinar. And I mean, I was just so inspired. It's I would say that it's probably the most motivational webinar that I've ever attended. It is really amazing. Um, it's and I'm. I'm not going to do a lot of introduction of Angela because she will tell you a little bit about herself and she has a really jam packed um, session um, planned for us. So I'm not really going to go into a lot of introductions, but Angela and I were um, both teachers. She was a third grade teacher. I was a fifth grade teacher. We both started websites um, many years ago and we ended up connecting. Um, somehow through the years as a result of that and we're sort of kindred souls I guess in some ways and I have really admired the work that Angela has done um, her, her, her work for teachers her uh, resources for teachers at first but now the productivity training and the work and the inspiring um, resources that she creates for teachers so Angela thank you so much for being with us um, I'm just thrilled to have you here and I'm going to turn this presentation over to you and you can start talking and <laughs> tell a little bit about yourself while we make that transition but I'm going to let you take it away from here okay sounds good um, thank you for the kind words I appreciate that and you know that I, f I feel the same way about you. Um, <laughs> very inspired by all of the work that you have been doing. So Laura and I are so glad that you guys are here. You are in the right place if you feel like you are just putting everyone else's needs before your own. If you feel like you're just never really having time and energy for yourself, you just only get the leftovers. Or if you know that you need to prioritize self-care, but you just haven't been able to create habits that you can stick with for the long term. There's always something else that comes up that seems to get in the way. So if any of that sounds like you, feel free to type the number that you relate to in that question box. And as Laura shared earlier, you won't be able to see each other's responses, but Laura and I will be able to see and we'll review it after the chat. Um, and if they all sound like you, feel free to type all. <laughs> and that way I'll know I'm on the right track here. I mean, I know I can certainly relate to all of this. I was in the classroom for 11 years. I've been an instructional coach for the last eight years. Um, and so I know that feeling of spending the entire day meeting other people's needs and having nothing left for yourself. I'm seeing lots of comments about all and um, lots of threes, lots of people relating to threes. You know, I think that a, a lack of time and energy is one of the biggest problems that teachers are facing. And I've spent the last three years supporting teachers with work-life balance through the 40-hour teacher work week club. And to be honest with you, sometimes it makes me really fired up because I'm seeing firsthand day in and day out just how much teachers are having to do with so few resources and support. A lot of times teachers think it's just them or it's just their district. And this is a nationwide, really a, a worldwide problem. You know, we're always hearing it's all about the kids. We got to do it for the kids. But sometimes it just feels like, well, who's taking care of teachers? And as a matter of fact, when I shared information about this webinar on my Facebook page, a teacher left this comment. She said, I would like this training. But if administrators aren't following suit, it seems like taking time for you is going to end up with you getting a bad score on your teacher evaluation. So I fully believe in this, but the guilt and fear of losing my job and my home security just cuts way too deep. And that comment really broke my heart and made me angry, not at her, but for her. Because even though many teachers maybe wouldn't be able to articulate that or have the guts to admit it, I know she's not alone in feeling that way. It's really not hard to make that assumption that the only way to be successful as a teacher is to put your students achievement before everything else in your life. If the kids or more accurately, other people's kids aren't your number one priority, if you're not working 24 seven for them, then you're letting everyone down and your students won't be successful. It's so easy to internalize that message, right? But this is the message that is passionately on my heart. And that is that there is no direct correlation between 
the number of hours that you work and your effectiveness as a teacher. We all know truly outstanding teachers who prioritize time with their own families and refuse to work nonstop. They just have those boundaries. And we all know teachers who work 12, 13, 14 hour days, but are still kind of teaching like it's 1984. So effective teaching is not about constantly working. It's about making sure that you are working on the right things. And once you start examining your habits and making sure that you're focused on things that are the best and highest use of your time, you will be able to make yourself a priority too. So as we're gonna explore together, um, self-care really does not have to be this big, complicated, expensive, time-consuming thing. It can be as simple as just two-minute habits that are peppered throughout your day. So instead of scrolling mindlessly through social media while you're making dinner, you can be listening to an uplifting podcast or music that you love. Instead of grading two and a half papers while you're waiting for a doctor's appointment, spend a couple minutes reading a book by your favorite novelist. Instead of worrying about work while you're driving and rehashing that negative interaction with a parent, you can be doing mindfulness or breathing exercises. This kind of self-care is not selfish. Taking care of yourself means that you have more to give your students. And staying up until 3 a.m. looking for the perfect lesson on Pinterest does not help you be energetic and in a good mood and present with your kids the next day. Kids benefit from having a healthy, happy, balanced teacher. And we all know this intuitively, right? We've all heard the saying, you can't pour from an empty cup. But the tricky part is to turn that from this truism that you believe into a life principle that you actually live. To stop just agreeing with it and really make it a reality in your life. And the way to do that is through creating these habits of self-care. The quality of your habits will determine the quality of your life. You will always be the last priority unless you have habits of self-care that are woven into your daily routines, unless self-care is just part of what you do. And that's why most of our attempts at self-care fail. We try to do one big nice thing for ourselves every now and then, and we expect that to tide us over for weeks afterward. So you get that one breakfast in bed on Mother's Day or that one girl's night out every six months, and you hope that somehow that's enough. But it doesn't really work that way, right? Because what you do on a regular basis is more important than what you do occasionally. Consistency is more important than intensity. And habits are what create your lifestyle. So I hope you can see why I chose to focus this entire training on how to create habits for self-care. There's no such thing as creating work-life balance once and for all. Like, oh, that's it. Now I'm in balance. I'm good. I don't have to think about it again. Self-care and balance are both about daily choices. And that's actually good news because creating better habits is pretty simple once you understand what works for you. So you can start today and see results immediately. Now, if you're a very logical, chronological thinker like I am, let me give you an overview of how the remainder of our time together today will be spent. So we're gonna talk next about choosing a self-care habit that is significant, but still easy to stick with. Then we'll look at understanding how to create self-care habits that work for your personality. We'll explore five keys to making sure your habit creates permanent change, not a temporary fix. And we'll wrap up by discussing how you can get ongoing support with your habits and create more time for yourself all throughout the school year. So I want you to start by choosing a very specific and actionable self-care habit for yourself today. It's good to think about all the possibilities now. So you can write down more than one thing that you'd like to do eventually, but to make this sustainable and not just one more thing that you can't find time for, I encourage you to focus on only one habit at a time. So here are some different categories of self-care that might be useful for you to think about. I'm gonna throw out a whole bunch of different ideas out there and feel free to tell us in that question box on the right side of your screen, what self-care habit you would like to try. So if you're a person who always feels rushed in the morning, if you feel like people are making demands on you before you've even woken up, then you might wanna think about a morning ritual that allows you to have 10 minutes to yourself so you can mentally prepare for the day. I did not used to be a morning person, but I started getting up 15 minutes earlier back in 2008 and it changed my entire life. And I still do it. I sit outside if the weather permits, I'll have a cup of coffee and just breathe or read or mentally prepare for the day, just get my head and my heart right. So that's an idea, or you might wanna think about midday breaks 
So something that you do for yourself so you don't feel like you're just going nonstop from sunup to sundown. And none of these midday breaks take longer than a couple minutes. They can re-energize you for hours afterwards if you pick something that works for your personality and your needs. Maybe your habit will be a nighttime ritual. So this is good for people who feel like they don't get any time to themselves until the whole family's in bed. And by that point, they're too exhausted to do anything. So maybe you want to shift around your tasks so you can head to bed earlier and have 30 minutes to lay there and read or watch your shows without cutting into your bedtime. You might want to create a rest and sleep habit. So if you're always physically tired and you're just collapsing into bed at night, make it your goal to create a habit of, let's say, seven hours of sleep each night. And you can start with five or six, whatever you need to, and work up slowly. Or instead of forcing yourself to stay in motion for 18 hours straight, schedule in 15 minutes in the late afternoon to just lie down and rest or nap. Your self-care habit could be centered around um, mental or emotional decompressing. So having a habit of this nature is really critical if you feel like you can never turn off your teacher brain, if your mind's just always going like a hamster on a treadmill. You might even want to give yourself permission to relax by scheduling in time for this. Just put nothing on your to-do list for a certain block of time. Or maybe your new habit will be related to physical self-care. So this is the way to go if your body is manifesting those physical symptoms of stress and you know you need to get healthy in a way that feels good to you. Or it might center on creative outlets and hobbies. So this is important if you just don't feel like yourself unless you get to spend regular time on a specific activity that you love. And finally, maybe your self-care habit needs to be something that feels like an indulgence or a luxury, something that you will gift to yourself on a regular basis that will lessen that feeling that you're always sacrificing your own wants. Now, I'm guessing you'd really like to choose one habit from each category, and you can do that eventually, but starting today, we're gonna focus on just one habit. You can't try to do too much at once or else you're gonna be right back where you started a couple weeks from now. So you can always add more later, but your first habit needs to fit two important criteria. It needs to be something that you want to maintain, because remember, we're not going for quick fixes here. Although you can tweak your habit and your needs over time, it needs to be something that you can stick with and make a regular part of your life. Your habit also needs to be something that has a meaningful impact on your well-being. So choose something that will make you feel happier or more rested or more productive. Don't just pick whatever sounds easiest or fun. You want this self-care habit to be something that will really take a weight off your shoulders, give you a real sense of satisfaction. It doesn't have to be big. It just has to be meaningful to you. And if you've figured out what it is you want to do, feel free to share with us in the question box. So now that you've got some idea of the self-care habit that you want to create, I'm going to give you some insights that will help you personalize the information that I'm going to share next. I'm not gonna help you think through whether you should spend your free time hiking in the woods or doing jigsaw puzzles. You already know what your interests are. You know what types of things you want to be doing. So this is about figuring out what kind of habit you need for your self-care, alone or with others. Same thing each time or keep switching it up. These are personal questions. They're things that only you can answer. And in many ways, this is the missing piece for many of us when it comes to habit creation. We try to do what someone else has done and then we wonder why it didn't work for us. So I wanna help you understand your needs a little bit better so that you can filter everything else that I teach you through the lens of how habits tend to work best for your personality. I think you'll probably have a pretty strong reaction to most of these. You're gonna be like, oh yes, that is me. That is exactly how I am. But if you happen to hear one that makes you say, well, I don't know, it depends, then you're probably a true mix. And so that factor isn't gonna be a major consideration. When you're developing your self-care habits, you only need to focus on the aspects of your personality that are really strong. So I'm going to briefly teach around the 10 questions that will help you implement self-care in a way that fits your personal preferences. And we'll talk about the implications of each answer. And as we go through these, if you want, you can tell us in the chat box which one sounds most like you. So here's the first question. Are you more motivated by your own goals or by the expectations that other people have for you? I'm a person who has very strong inner goals. I know what I want for myself. And I find that trying to involve other people in holding me to my goals just makes me rebellious. But other people find that they actually do better when they feel like there's a community of people who are depending on them. So these are the people who join book clubs so they have motivation to finish reading the book. Or they get Fitbits so their friends can see how many steps they take each day 
and the competition or the support motivates them to keep going. So neither one of these personality traits is better than the other. There's no right or wrong here or with any of the other nine questions that I'll pose to you. But it's very important to know which personality sounds like you. If you're motivated by personal goals like I am, then you don't need to make a big announcement about your habit. Just go at your own pace, do what works for you. If you do like external accountability, then don't fight that and try to do it on your own. Get a friend or a partner or a colleague who either makes the change with you or creates his or her own self-care habit and will check in with you. We found that people with this personality type who are members of the 40-hour teacher work week club, when they post about their goals or their habits in the club's Facebook group, it's really helpful for them because other teachers will chime in and join them or they'll share their own progress. So you can even use social media to make you feel like you've got support and community for your habit. The next question, do you like to take on one thing at a time or many? Some people get very overwhelmed if they try to do too much at once. So for them, they'd rather concentrate on doing one thing really well and mastering it. Other people get bored when they try to do just one thing at a time. They want more results faster and they like a big challenge. So people like that might wanna try implementing two habits that complement one another, like exercise and eating healthy, or not grading papers at night and making time to talk to a spouse or a partner. Third question, does it feel easier to you when you make small changes slowly over time or when you make one big change all at once? So if you were trying to quit smoking, would you be the person who reduces your daily cigarettes a few at a time until you eventually stop? Or would you take more of a cold turkey approach? If you like small changes, look for habits that require less effort and that are easy to implement. And then you can stack those habits over time. If you prefer big dramatic changes, then pick one thing that will really move the needle and just do that one thing. Another thing to consider, do you prefer comfortable, familiar habits or habits that allow for spontaneity and novelty? This one is also really important to understand for long-term success. Because if you like novelty and you create rigid habits for yourself where you don't feel like you can be spontaneous, then the habit's not gonna stick. And I'm that way myself. It often surprises people to hear it because I talk so much about list making and scheduling out my time and routines and habits. They assume I must be very rigid about it, but I very rarely stick to the same daily schedule. When I, when I feel myself hitting that low energy point in the late afternoon, I don't always implement the same self-care habit. Sometimes I'll have a cup of coffee and wake up. Sometimes I'll say, forget it. I'm just going to lay down on the couch for 10 minutes and rest. So it's not always the same thing. I like to have different options in the mix, but I choose something. I don't just force myself to keep going and going and going with no break for my body or for my mind. So if you're like me, it might be better to simply block off time each week for self-care and then wait till that time comes to decide how you want to use it. If your self-care habit is time in the evenings to decompress, then maybe it will be a hot bath each night for a while and then you'll get tired of it. And then it will be sitting out on the porch and FaceTiming with a friend. If you're the opposite and you like familiarity and routine, then you'll want more structure. So plan to keep your self-care habit as similar as possible each time so that you don't have to think about it. You want your habit to feel like your favorite cozy sweater, just something comfortable and easy to slip into. Every night at 9 p.m., that's your time to have a glass of something and read. Or every Saturday morning, you go for a swim first thing. That's just what you do. Now, this question might be harder for you to answer. Which feels more satisfying, starting something new or bringing something old to completion? Some people love new projects, but they have trouble following through. They only have energy at the beginning. So if that sounds like you, the key here is to pick smaller habits. People who are starters like to jump in, experience something or get results and be done. So pick a habit that is simpler and easier to complete and doesn't require follow through later. If you find greater satisfaction in completing something, then your self-care habit might revolve around something a little deeper and more big picture. So people who are finishers tend to like puzzles or painting or other projects that just take a while to complete. They want a larger goal that they can work toward for a long time. Next, do you like to work in marathons or sprints? This is important because making your self-care habit sustainable is really about ensuring that your other tasks are complete so that you have that time for yourself. So are you a person who would rather spend the whole Sunday afternoon grading papers 
so that you don't have to think about it again for the rest of the week. Or a person who would rather just grade a few assignments every day so you don't have to give up a big chunk of your weekend. Understanding your preference here will help you know if you want to space out your tasks so that you do a little bit each day or if it's better to batch it so you don't have to think about it as often. And it might also help you to decide whether you want to make a lot of time for self-care on one day of the week or if you want to have a bit of time daily. Now you probably have a good idea already about whether you're at your best earlier in the day or late at night. But the key here is to ensure that you're scheduling your most important tasks for the time when you're at your best. And taking care of yourself has to be one of your most important tasks. If you're falling asleep at 8 p.m., then giving yourself downtime at 10 p.m. is probably gonna be too late. Or if you hit the snooze button 100 times every morning, getting up even earlier might be a habit that you don't make the most of because you're not even awake enough to benefit. Make sure your self-care aligns with how your body works naturally. Three more. Do you recharge your energy by being with people or by being alone? Now, I could have called this being an extrovert versus an introvert, but I feel like those terms come with a lot of misconceptions, and I wanted to spell out what I'm really talking about here. Because being an introvert doesn't necessarily mean that you don't like people or that you're awkward around people. This is what it does mean. If you need to spend time alone after being with people so that you can recharge, then you're probably an introvert. If you need to spend time with people after a time of being alone, then you're probably an extrovert. It's all about what energizes you. Is it being with others or being by yourself? So if you're an introvert, your self-care habits need to include alone time. And if you're an extrovert, it needs to be time with people. That doesn't mean you won't need both, but when we're taking this first simple step toward prioritizing yourself, think about whether your habit needs to be with people or on your own. Next one, do you prefer measuring or guesstimating? This is about whether you enjoy tracking concrete measurable results or if you would resent having to quantify your self-care. For example, in the 40-hour teacher workweek club, I encourage members to spend one week in October after the back-to-school craziness starts winding down a little bit and actually track how many hours they work. It's very important to know where your time is being spent so you can figure out where to streamline later. Well, some people jump right into this exercise. They download a free app like Toggle and they track not only their work hours, but how much time they spend on everything. And some of them enjoy it so much that they do this all throughout the school year. They keep up this habit beyond that one week of always tracking how they use their time. These are people who like to measure their habits. Others are more like me and they hate the idea of having to track how they use their time. They would rather measure success by how much work they're bringing home. When asked to track their time, they simply think back at the end of the day and ask themselves, mm, about how long did I spend on schoolwork today? And they write down a guesstimate. That's good enough for people like us who don't want to fuss with exact numbers. So if you resent tracking, then you don't need to consider that for your self-care habit. And I would, in fact, recommend that you don't track at all because it will suck all the enjoyment out of it. But if you're a person who thrives off having those measurable concrete results, then pick a self-care habit that will provide you with it. Use a tracking tool for your exercise or log the number of books you read, or even the number of pages you read each day. Now, this final one is a little tricky, and I credit Gretchen Rubin in particular for her work around this. It's important to know if balance is easier for you when you do unhealthy things in moderation or you abstain from them altogether. So for example, if you're wanting to replace a habit of mindless TV watching with spending time together as a family, you need to decide if TV is something you should abstain from altogether in the evenings or do in moderation. So an abstainer will find it easier to just create a rule for him or herself. Just, I don't watch TV at all in the evenings. Once it's on, it's too hard to turn off. Everyone zones out into their own world. We're not watching TV except on weekends. And that removes the decision-making burden of, should I turn on the TV or not? Is it okay to make an exception for this? But a moderator won't like the idea of abstaining altogether. And we'll have guidelines instead for doing it in moderation. So maybe, maybe you might say, well, I'll only turn on the TV after 9 p.m. Or I'll only watch one show in the evenings. Or I'll just watch this one thing on Netflix. You see, deprivation will lead to a binge for a person who's a moderator. It makes the habit harder to stick with. They don't want to deprive themselves. But deprivation actually works better for the abstainer. Just stay away from it altogether and just make it a hard and fast rule. So those are the 10 personality factors to consider when choosing how to set up your self-care habit. So if you've been here from the beginning, um, you now know 
why habits for self-care are so important and what kinds of habits you might wanna create. And you understand your own personality type. So you know what's gonna work for you for the long term. So now, what do you do with this information? That's what I'm gonna teach you next. I'm gonna share five important principles about how habits are formed and how you can stick with them. I want you to consider these five principles of habit creation through the lens of your personality type so that you can figure out a system that works for you. Now, something very important to know here is that it does not take 21 days to form a new habit. That's completely untrue in most cases. It's been debunked by many, many studies. If you've ever had ice cream after dinner one night and then decided the second night to do it again, you already know that by that third night, you're gonna be thinking about ice cream after dinner. You only had to do the action twice. You didn't even mean for it to become a habit. And already it's something that you're thinking about every night from now on. Now, obviously some habits are easier to form than others, but I find that it only takes repeating an action a handful of times before it starts to feel somewhat natural. And I think the same is gonna hold true for you. You are going to start experiencing a difference right away when you follow these five principles for your self-care habit. So the first one is to get clear on your why and to communicate it clearly to the people around you. For many of you, I think the big picture why is already really clear. You wanna take care of yourself so you don't burn out from working 24 seven. You wanna make sure you stay healthy so that the stress doesn't create physical problems. You wanna make sure that you don't live with regret about missing your kid's childhood because every time they tried to get your attention, you were busy writing papers. But you still need to make sure that you have a compelling enough and specific enough why to make you stick with it for the long term. So when we talk about getting healthy, you know, you would think that not getting disease in our bodies would be enough of a motivator to eat right and to work out. But clearly for most of us, based on our lifestyle choices, it's not enough. And that's because it's too big, too abstract of a goal. And we convince ourselves that this one little thing that we're doing today doesn't really matter. So you have to make the why more concrete and more attainable. So if I'm gonna eat better so that I live a long and healthy life, then having two donuts for breakfast today probably won't make much of a difference in the course of my, life, my lifetime. It's pretty easy to rationalize it. I can make excuses for why it's okay. But if I'm gonna eat better so I don't experience a sugar crash that wrecks my energy in the afternoon, then eating two donuts is gonna be a big problem. It's much easier to stick with my habit when my why is smaller and more immediate or urgent and very specific. So once you know your specific urgent why, get your family or whoever you live with on board, help them understand your why so they can be supportive of your habit. Talk together about how to make the habit work so they don't interrupt or derail your habit formation without realizing it. It's also very helpful to surround yourself with people who are working toward the same goals or even better people who are already excelling in those areas. So if you wanna work less, hang out with your colleagues who prioritize their personal time or collaborate in the 40 hour teacher work week clubs, Facebook group. If you wanna eat healthier, hang out with friends who have been doing vegetable based diets for years. If you wanna be creative, connect with people who write or paint or sculpt. They will not only help you work toward your own goals, but their success will inspire you to keep going. The second key to making your habit stick is to create an environment that reinforces it. So you don't have to make a conscious decision to follow through with your habit every time. You always wanna rely on habits over willpower because unfortunately, willpower is a limited resource. Willpower also decreases throughout the day, the more that we use it. And that's why so many of us manage to stay in control all day and then overindulge in the evening. It's why we can be patient with our students or our family members all morning, but by the end of the day, we're snapping at them. It's because we've been exercising self-control in so many areas of our lives all day long. And frankly, we just get tired of it. We're out of willpower. We just give in to whatever behavior provides a release or just lets us relax and feel good. You don't have to rely on willpower in the evenings when you're already exhausted from doing that all day during the class classroom. Don't use up all your willpower and force yourself to do everything you need to do each day. Instead, invest your willpower strategically to create new habits because these habits will serve you for years to come. And it becomes a lot easier when you set up your environment to create a trigger for your habit. So see if you can think about a when this 
kind of cue for self-care. So when X happens, happens, you will do Y. When you get in the car in the morning, you will put on your favorite song that uplifts and inspires you. When you brush your teeth, you will think words of affirmation or repeat positive thoughts about your day. You can do the same thing time after time and it will create an almost Pavlovian response where as soon as you finish cleaning up dinner, you crave that nice hot bath. Or as soon as the kids leave the classroom, you crave that 60 seconds of deep breathing. Now, if you like a lot of novelty, you can switch things up frequently, but do be mindful of the triggers for your habit. They're very powerful. You can pair up your self-care habit with something that you're already doing. And that way the two habits will be intertwined. For example, I have a really good skincare regimen that I like a lot, but in the morning, I just wanna jump into my day. I don't feel like messing around with moisturizing my face. And in the evenings, I'm tired. I wanna be laying on the couch. I don't wanna be going through a five-step skin cleansing process. So I paired the self-care habit that I couldn't seem to prioritize with something that I like a little better. And that is listening to audiobooks. I have one particular book that's easy to jump in and out of. And I listen to it for a couple minutes each morning while I'm taking care of my skin and putting on makeup. And then a few minutes again at the end of the day when I'm cleaning it off. So the pairing of these two habits made them both stronger. I might not feel a strong pull to moisturize my face, but every time that I want to listen to this book, I think about it. The two activities are now intertwined. It's an easier habit to keep. So if you can think of an existing habit that might pair up well with the self-care habit you're choosing, feel free to share that in the chat box with us so you can let us know what you're thinking. Now, your mind might be racing with a bunch of different ideas right now. There's so many simple, easy things you could do to carve out more time for you. But it's very important to start small so that you can experience success. Do not make these self-care habits one more thing that you feel guilty about not doing. It should not be one more thing on your plate. If you set the bar too high for yourself, you won't be able to stick with it and you'll get discouraged. And here's why. You get the most momentum the first time you try to create a habit. When you set the bar too high and you fail, you have to muster up that willpower to begin again later. And it's harder to rely on willpower than habits. And your willpower for this particular habit is already gonna be gone. The habit's not nearly as exciting the second time you try to get back on board. And by the 10th or the 20th time, you're gonna feel like this is impossible. You see, once you stop your habit, you no longer have a positive association with it. The habit is now associated with failure. You feel like you messed up. So it's gonna take more energy to get started again. The secret then is to make it so easy that you can't mess up. And you can do this by creating a mini habit. So if you can't get motivated to go for a walk every evening, the mini habit might be just to step outside and get a few seconds of fresh air. Once you have your shoes on and you're outside, you might find it easier to push yourself to walk just to the end of the block. Once you're at the end of the block, you might find it easier to walk another block. And if not, that's okay. Go back home. Your mini habit was just to get outside and have some fresh air. Start with that and get some momentum. The motivation will come later once you start experiencing success, once you stop feeling like it's just another thing that you have to feel guilty about not doing. You see, with habits, simple does not necessarily mean easy. And sometimes it's better to stop trying to get motivation and instead try to get momentum. Just get yourself started. Scale your habit down a little bit so it's not so daunting and make it something you can do even when you've had a busy day or when you're really, really exhausted. There's two questions that have been really helpful for me when I find myself um, not being able to stick with my habit, because there's always interruptions that come up, right? There's always habits and routines that, um, that just throw things off. So when I find that I can't stick with it, the first question that, that I ask myself is, can I just? And I try thinking of something that is so easy, it requires basically no willpower. So I can't spend time with my mom today like I hoped. Can I just call her on the way to the grocery store? I can't take a nap like I plan this afternoon. Can I just sit for five minutes and relax? Ask yourself, can I just? And see what your first thought is. It's probably the right one. The other question that helps me a lot is, what would it look like if it were easy? And that's because I'm a person who loves excellence. I want everything to be done to the highest standard, particularly in my work. 
And all of this is great for the people I'm trying to help, but it can cause me to get trapped in this habit of seeking perfection instead of just trying to get it done. Perfect is the opposite of done. It will never get done if I insist that it be perfect. So I ask myself throughout the day, literally all day long, I'm asking myself, what would it look like if it were easy? And this question gives me some distance from the problem, helps me think about how another person might approach it or the advice that I would give to someone else in my situation. When you don't know what to make for dinner and you're just staring in the refrigerator, ask yourself, what would this look like if it were easy? And you'll immediately know what the simplest solution is. When your entire house is a wreck and you can't figure out where to get started cleaning, ask yourself, what would this look like if it were easy? And you'll find yourself intuitively knowing, just pick up the items you see right in front of you. Can I just pick up these things that are right here at my feet? Now, here's a really important mindset shift. This might be the most important element when it comes to making your new habits stick. Every time you are tempted to go back to your old ways of doing things or to skip your self-care habit, remind yourself that this is not about what you eat or how much you sleep or how you manage your time. This is about creating habits. Each time you go back to the old habit, you are strengthening those neural pathways in the brain and the muscle memory in the body. And those are gonna make you wanna to default to that habit again in the future. So breaking the habit just this once won't hurt you in the sense that it will create problems in that area of your life. Breaking the habit just this once will wreak havoc on your habits. And that's what you wanna protect at all costs. You know, I think you'll find that habits will take longer to stick when you create loopholes or exceptions or excuses. I did that for myself when I was trying to create a habit around not going on social media after 9 p.m. I would make excuses all the time. Well, this article is really good. Uh, it's okay for me to read this instead of a book. And every time that I made an exception, I undermined my own habit. And I made it twice as hard to not get on social media again the following night when I was supposed to be in bed. Recently, I've been doing very well with this habit. I find myself really looking forward to crawling under the covers with a good book and just shutting out the entire online world. But that only happened because I focused on the habit of the habit. Because while some habits are stronger than we assume, it's also true that habits can be surprisingly fragile. They're built on routines. And when we break those routines, habits can fall apart pretty quickly. So here's a few things that you can do to prevent changes in routine from messing up your habit. One is to avoid breaking your self-care habit twice in a row. After you skipped it twice, it's a lot harder to follow through the second time. Another thing you can do to prevent losing your habits is to plan your exceptions in advance. There's always gonna be life circumstances that prevent you from following through, but you have to give yourself permission ahead of time to break from the habit. So if you wanna create a habit of replacing processed sugar with natural sweeteners, but you know you're meeting a friend for coffee at your favorite bakery this weekend, then decide in advance that you will have dessert there instead of intending to stick to your habit and then breaking it. A third and final thing you can do to avoid losing your habit is to prepare what you'll do when you don't follow through or you hit a setback. How will you talk yourself into continuing the next time you're too tired to follow through? When you prepare yourself mentally and you rehearse how you're gonna deal with it in the future, it makes it easier to resist temptation and stay on track with your goals. So remember, the habit of the habit is more important than the habit itself. It's okay to do it poorly. It's okay to do it barely at all, as long as you do it. Don't concern yourself too much here with the outcome. Focus on right actions over right results. Because when it comes to achieving, we have to always assume that whatever it is you're doing today is what you'll probably do tomorrow, and next week, and next month, and next year. That will help you become hyper-focused on the choices that you're making now, in the moment, rather than assuming that your future self will be more disciplined, or that you'll have more free time later. We tend to think our future selves will be much more productive and balanced than our future selves, but the truth is that our future schedules are likely to be very similar to our current schedules. All you have to do is look at your habits. Ask yourself, will I have better work-life balance? Will I have more time for myself in the future if I keep doing what I'm doing today? So just take the right steps now and trust that creating good habits will pay off for you later over time. Now I save this one for last because it's the most important and it's also often the hardest. 
particularly for many women and particularly for many teachers who are used to making sure that everyone else's needs are met before they focus on their own. Learning to believe that your needs should be a priority is a big mindset shift and it can take time. So I'm gonna share some little tricks that you can use to make it easier. You can increase the chances of sticking with your habit if you're willing to invest in yourself and invest in that habit a little bit. So for example, let's say that you wanna get in the habit of sitting on your apartment balcony and watching the sunset each evening or having a few minutes of quiet reflective time out there. Maybe one of the reasons that you've avoided that is because your couch is a lot more comfortable than whatever chair is outside. So invest in an outdoor chair that you want to sit in. That's going to make it easier for you to follow through with your habit. If you want to go for a run in the evenings, buy a good pair of running shoes that are comfortable and that you really like putting on. If you want to be reflecting on something that you're grateful for every day, invest in a gratitude journal of some sort or buy a book or take a course on practicing gratitude. Take a mindfulness class at your local community center. You see, once you've signed up for something or you've purchased something, you know that you have some skin in the game. If you really wanna make change in your life and make your new habit a priority, one of the best ways to do that is by being willing to put a little bit of money toward it. If your habit's really important, you'd probably be willing to put a lot of money toward it. Imagine if you'd paid $500 to watch this webinar, how much more committed do you think you would be to paying attention to every word and really making your self-care habits stick. No one wants to waste money, right? So that's a strong incentive to help you stick to your goals. Investing in your habit is especially important when you've been struggling with it for a long time. Often it's better to invest in structured programs rather than wasting time trying to compile random ideas or random information that may or may not give you real results. Treating your self-care like something that is a priority, not only with your time, but with your resources, is really important. If your spouse or your partner or your child needed something that would help them be happier or healthier, you would probably move mountains to make sure that they got it. It's okay to spend money on yourself sometimes. Value yourself enough to invest in whatever it takes for you to be happy and healthy too. You have to remember the principle of opportunity cost. Every time you say yes to one thing, you are saying no to something else. When you continue to say yes to every person who makes a demand on your time, you are in effect saying no to taking care of yourself. When you invest all your time and money and energy into resources for others, you're saying no to your own well-being. And no one knows what you need as well as you do. If you don't speak up, if you don't insist on time for yourself, no one else will probably do that for you. You can't just wait and hope that something changes or wait and hope that this busy season of life will pass and you'll somehow still be in good physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health afterward. That's a really big risk to take. If you don't make self-care a priority now, when will you? Let's be real about what will happen if you don't decide. You really wanna create change. Deciding how to establish self-care habits will just be one more thing you wish you had time for, can't prioritize and you'll continue to come home each night completely worn out with hours of schoolwork still ahead of you. That feeling of never being finished and never being able to totally relax will still be a daily struggle for the rest of your career. The problem doesn't go away if you ignore it. At some point you have to decide enough is enough. You and your family deserve better. And I promise you this from my own experience and from the experience I've seen of thousands of other teachers that I've coached in the 40 hour teacher work week club. I'm telling you, teaching does not have to be this all consuming job that leaves you with nothing left to give yourself or the people you care about. You can be an amazing teacher and still take care of yourself. You are worth the investment. Gaining more time to take care of yourself is worth the investment. Prioritize your own self-care instead of settling for scraps. Taking care of yourself is one of the least selfish things you can do because that's what ensures that you are able to take care of others. Think back to why you showed up here today. Because you put other people's needs before your own, because you never have enough time and energy for everything, or because you know you need to prioritize self-care but you just haven't been able to create habits that you can stick with. If you really wanna get serious about prioritizing self-care, you have a couple of options for making sure those habits are a regular part of your life from this day forward. The first option is to follow through on your own. 
So maybe you've tried before to get your life in better balance and make time for yourself and you didn't really stick with it, but you can promise yourself that things will be different this time. I have given you more than enough information today for you to get started. You have all the tools you need for starting better habits and prioritizing self-care. You can totally do this. Start small, have realistic attainable habits, and then stack more habits on from there. The second option is to use a proven system for self-care and habit creation and learning how to prioritize. I've already done most of this hard work in figuring out what habits most teachers need to create better balance. And I can show you step-by-step -step exactly how to streamline and simplify every aspect of your work in your home life so that you have more time for yourself. You can utilize the years of research that I've done and all my experience mentoring thousands of other teachers on productivity and let me provide the support you need to finally get out of survival mode and enjoy your life a whole lot more. You see, watching a webinar is enough for most people to get started on the right foot. But a few weeks later, they often find that they forget what they learned and they go back to their old ways of doing things. And if you're worried that this is what will happen for you, you have the option to get support from me and a huge community of other teachers in changing your habits over time. I would like for me and the other teachers to be there to help you create and maintain habits throughout the summer when you're planning how to set up your classroom to facilitate productivity and designing routines to create a self-running classroom. I'd like to be alongside you in the fall when you're struggling to keep your head above water because reality hit, you are feeling overwhelmed and exhausted and everything that you had hoped or sort of envisioned for the school year kind of came crashing down once you started getting bogged down in those day-to-day -day demands again. I wanna help you create and maintain habits this winter when testing season is killing your motivation or you're drowning in papers that need to be graded and having to um, return parent emails or parent phone calls all the time. I wanna support you with habits in the spring when you feel like the kids and you are just done for the year. You need new motivation to keep going. You need to revamp that class culture, try some new interesting activities and really end the school year strong. See, each season of teaching is different and you need different types of support at different times. I don't want you to try to change your habits in every area at one time. That's what creates overwhelm. That's what keeps you stuck in these surface habits instead of getting real transformation. And I don't want you to learn something from me once, do great for a while, and then slip back into how things used to be. I wanna teach you strategies that build on one another so that you continue to streamline your workflow flow throughout the entire year. That's the entire purpose of the 40 hour teacher work week club. It's professional development for teacher productivity. It's fun and it actually works. This is why I created the club. I wanted to help you permanently trim three or five or even 10 or more hours off of your work week. But this is the piece that I don't want you to miss. Even though I guarantee that the club will help you work fewer hours, working fewer hours isn't the real goal for most people who join. Even productivity itself isn't usually the goal. We're not just trying to do more in less time for the sake of getting more done. Productivity is the means to the goal. It's a way to get back to your why. Remember that why that you established in the beginning of our time together? The reason why self-care is so important in your life right now? That's your real goal with the club. If you had an extra two hours a day, what would you do with it? The average teacher who joins is working 62 hours a week. And by the time she or he completes the program, the average work week is 51. How could you take better care of yourself if you had an extra 11 hours a week or 500 plus hours a year? How much more time would you have with your family and your friends? How much less exhausted would you be? That's the goal. Productivity is just the means to that goal. So the club is designed to help you with this. If you are completely disorganized and overwhelmed, you don't know where to start, you have no idea where to streamline or prioritize. And it's also designed to help if you know basically what to do, but you just keep slipping into bad habits. You're getting bogged down by all the different demands and you just feel like you can never really get ahead. So if this were a weight loss program, the people in that first group would be the ones who have 50 or more pounds to lose. And those in the second group would be the ones who are struggling to shed those last 15 pounds that they've been gaining and losing, gaining and losing for years. The people in the first group will have the more dramatic results 
for sure. But the people in the second group have a big hurdle to overcome too, that two steps forward, one step back frustration. So the club provides a workable system for both groups of teachers so that no one has to reinvent the wheel. If you want a proven system and support and accountability, and you want it to be something that can be maintained for years to come, that's what the club is designed to help you do. And it works no matter how busy you are or how skeptical you are, that there's really that many things you could do that will really make a difference. Let me share with you quickly how the club works, and then we're going to move into a question and answer time when I answer your questions here live together. So those who join the club get 52 weeks of new classroom tested productivity strategies. You get them in a written form and audio. So if you want to, you can just listen instead of having to read. Members also get hundreds of dollars worth of printable teaching resources and forms and templates to save you time. Most of them are designed for you as a teacher to help you streamline grading and lesson planning and parent communication. That's why the grade level that you teach or the type of curriculum you use doesn't have a huge impact on whether the club is effective. The printables are designed for student use are things like community building activities or growth mindset resources or homework accountability systems. And there's a variety included for many different grade levels K to 12. So you just pick and choose what works for your students. And many are editable, so you can customize them if you want. Members also get two free bonuses. And that list making system is a system that will show you exactly how to plan your time. And it provides editable forms that you can use for figuring out your priorities and your goals. These lists are really the key to cutting back your work hours right away. Members have consistently said that those lists have been their biggest game changer of anything they learned. Additionally, members get access to a private Facebook group where I and thousands of other teachers are answering questions and sharing ideas. There's actually two groups. There's one for elementary and one for secondary so that middle and high school teachers can discuss ways to adapt the ideas for their specific teaching context. And you have ongoing access to the private Facebook group indefinitely. So you can get support in there for a long, long time to come. And finally, when your year in the club is up, you keep your access to all the club resources in the membership site and you get a certificate to document your participation. I can't guarantee that your district will accept the club as PD credit because every district and state has their own requirements. But we have a brochure that you can give your administrators to explain the purpose of the club. It shows the research behind the principles. It shows the data on the effectiveness and the positive impact it's had on kids. So you can give that to them and see if they will honor it as continuing education credits. And we'll verify up through 104 hours, so around two hours per week throughout the year. Now, the club is open to new members twice a year. There's a July cohort and a January cohort. So it's sort of like a course where there's a defined start and ending time. And each month we focus on just one thing at a time. I'll give you a whole bunch of ideas around a central theme, and then you pick and choose a couple different things to try, just like you did with today's webinar. Some of the ideas won't work for your personality or your teaching context or what your principal mandates you to do. But just like with this webinar, you pick the ideas that resonate for you. You don't have to do it all. It's not going to all be necessarily for you. You just pick the strategies that resonate. There will be something every single week that works for your teaching context, no matter what or where you teach. And you only need to pick one thing to try in order to get results. Because each week, in addition to the practical strategies, I'm weaving in the sorts of mindset shifts and habits that will help you make the tips work and make them stick for you for the long term. So we talked earlier about the different personality types and how that affects habits. The club is designed to be adaptable for any personality type. If you want accountability, there's lots of that. If you want to work on your own, that's fine too. If you want to take baby steps, you can go slowly. If you like dramatic results, do more. If you want to be working marathons, wait until the end of the month and download everything at once. If you like sprints, then just spend a few minutes each week reading through the week's PDF. So I give you a blueprint like this at the beginning of each month so that you can see your week by week goals. If you fall behind and you can only spend, let's say 30 minutes on the month for the club materials, just do that one thing on the blueprint and you will see major changes in your workload and your work life balance. In the monthly blueprint, I also give you outcomes to look for so you know exactly what you're working toward and what kind of changes you should be seeing in your life. If you want to continue this process of creating better habits in more areas of your life and work, if you want to prioritize self-care all throughout the school year, then the system that I've set up with the club will help you do that. And it's a guarantee 
If it's something that sounds like it would be helpful for you, but you're just not really sure, I've set it up so there's no risk to you in joining because you have an entire month to get in there. Check out the bonuses, check out all the July resources and decide if this is going to be something that works for you. And if it isn't, just send me an email in the first 30 days. I'll give you all your money back. So you really have nothing to lose and that's by design. I don't want you to settle for not changing your habits because you were afraid that this would be a waste of money or something that you can't stick with. Because see, here's the thing that I've learned from the past two and a half years of working with teachers in the club. They don't normally doubt whether the club is good. If you've ever read my blog or watched my other webinars or listened to my podcast or read my books, you already know that I'm putting quality resources into the world. So it's not that. The little nagging question for most teachers is, will it work for me? Will I be able to stick with it? Will I be able to put in the work that's needed to get results when I'm so busy already? I don't know that the system will actually work for me because my situation is probably different from the teachers who got great results. They probably don't have the obligations on their time that I do or the demanding principles that I do. I don't know if I have the willpower and time to put in that they did to get those results. But you just listen to me do a training on habits. And I think now you understand the power of habit and the importance of changing the way that you care for yourself. Self-doubt will keep you from creating change in your life. Making excuses about why you can't do it or why it won't work for you, that's what keeps you stuck. You have to believe that there is a better way and that change is possible for you because it is. Just like with any habit, you're not expected to keep up with or implement the ideas from the club perfectly. And that's because there's no perfect people in the club. There are teachers who have trimmed 10 or 20 hours off their week, and they're not perfect. They have elderly parents to take care of. They have young children at home. They're getting their master's degree. They have all kinds of obligations on their time, just like you do. I don't know a single teacher who trimmed hours off their work week who didn't fall behind with the club materials. To my knowledge, they all skipped weeks, and yet they still got results. And you know why? Because it's not about the strategies. It's not about keeping up with the or content every week or doing this long list of tasks. It's about shifting your mindset and creating better habits. It's about learning to approach your work and your self-care differently. And you can do that without being a perfect person and without keeping up perfectly every single week. Even though the club is a one-year program, you still have access to all the materials after your year is up. I don't expect anyone to read and do everything during their year in the club. That's why I call it a club and not a course. You can go at your own pace and you can create new habits using the strategies I gave you in this training that are designed for your personality. You can even use those habit creation strategies to create habits for using the club materials. You can probably predict that the club members who get the best results are the ones who have a habit of listening to the club content or reading it each week. They might choose to listen to the audio on Monday morning on their way to school. So while they're driving in their car, that's how they do it or they listen to it on Tuesday afternoons when they go to the gym. They might choose to sit down on Sunday morning before the family gets up and make coffee, read the club content, and start planning out their week ahead. We will help you create habits so that you can build the club into whatever you're already doing. Pair it up with a habit that's already in place and it won't become just one more thing on your plate. The club is designed to help you for the rest of your teaching career. You join for one year and what you learn is going to change your approach to self-care and to this profession for as many years as you choose to be in the classroom. This is the reason why the club resources are not grade level or subject area specific. It's just like with this webinar tonight. It doesn't really matter what you teach or what grade you get moved to later. These strategies are still going to work because you carry that mindset and those habits with you. So the club is designed for grades K to 12. General Education, United States. That's who it's designed for. But it doesn't matter if you teach first grade or 10th grade, if you're a science teacher or reading teacher, the resources will help you create permanent change in your life. Or you can just send me an email within 30 days of joining and say, it's not gonna work for me. I'll have you fill out a quick form so I can process your refund. You get all your money back. So this is the investment for learning how to trim five or 10 hours off your work week for the rest of your teaching career. So you can finally make yourself a priority. It's $119.99, and that's a one-time payment. That's the entire program. Or you can pay in four installments if you'd rather and be billed quarterly. The one-time payment covers your full year in the club, 
and after which point you graduate, so that's the only time you ever pay a thing. The quarterly payment option continues for one year and then stops automatically and you're never charged again. And you can keep using the membership library and the Facebook group as much as you want to, even after your year is up for free. So really quickly here, let me show you a summary of what you're getting when you sign up, and then I'll give you the sign up link and we'll answer some questions live. So it's 52 weeks of new classroom tested productivity strategies, in PDF and audio form. You get printable resources, forms, and templates to save you time. If you were to try to purchase all those resources separately, it would cost you so much more than 119, and you'd only be able to get a fraction of them because a lot of them are club exclusives. You can't get them anywhere else. You get access to the bonuses, plus a special recording of this training for club members, and access to a private Facebook group for elementary or secondary teachers where we'll answer questions and share ideas. And that's really priceless. I can't even put a dollar amount on not feeling alone with what you're struggling with and with having mentorship and companionship. And of course, your professional development certificate at the end of the year to document your participation. So that investment in yourself and your self-care and your habits is $119.99, and that's indefinite access to all the course materials and the Facebook group for years to come. Now, if you're ready to join now, you can go to the link that is here on the screen. If you're watching this live and not the replay, Laura's putting a clickable link for you in the side panel of the webinar by the chat box. This is not the actual purchase page on my site. This is a page on Laura's site where she's got the certificate of attendance for the webinar, link for the replay, and also a special offer for you. So if you join the club through this link, you get that. Now, I would suggest you wait to make your purchase until she tells you about the special bonus that she's giving away, because she's going to explain in about another minute here what that is that she's giving to you. But I just want to show you real quick first what happens when you complete the sign-up process so that you don't have any problems or surprises. So when you click the link from Laura's page, you'll end up at 40hew.com, and that's a page that's packed full of information about the club to answer every question you can think of. But there's also a payment section that looks like this. So you'll choose either the one-time or the quarterly payment option. And choose carefully because, unfortunately, I don't have the ability to prorate things and to let people change their option later. Obviously, the one-time payment is the best value. So let's say you click on that, and then the next thing you see is the payment page for the checkout. So this is where you enter your credit or debit card information. And it explains at the top that your payment information is fully encrypted and protected. There's also instructions not to use a school email address, because a lot of times school servers will block bulk emails, like the ones that you get from the club. So you click that Buy Now button at the bottom of the page, but don't click away quite yet because you won't be quite done. You need to wait until you get through to the thank you page. And that has this big button that says register. Once you click that, you can create your username and your password. So once you're able to create your username or your password, you'll be taken directly to the membership site and you're in. So that's how the purchasing system works. I'm going to hand this over to Laura so she can tell you about the special bonus offer she has for those who join the club through her link. And then we'll do some questions. Okay, Angela, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it was just as amazing as um, the one I listened to last night and it gave, listening to it again was, was nice because I could really focus on some new aspects of it. But um, I just wanna thank you once again for taking time to present um, this special webinar for you know, my followers, the people who signed up um, through me, I know they appreciate it. And those who weren't able to make the live session will um, enjoy, you know, listening to the replay later. Um, so I'm going to go over to that page, but I guess I wanted to just say a couple of things before we go there. Um, I just, there's so many things going through my mind right now about the 40 hour teacher work week club and how valuable this resource is. And I think about how, you know, you said in your webinar that, um, you know, you've given them the tools to, to know how to make um, something that they want to do into a habit. But as um, a teacher, myself, a former teacher, I worked for 30 years. I worked really, really long hours. And I never realized that there was another way to be than just to work like 75 hours a week. I mean, I just put in crazy hours. And I really didn't think there was any other way to do it. And then when 
you started creating your course and I enrolled in it and I started reading some of your lessons and listening to some of the, you know, you have it in podcast form. I call it podcast. I know it's not a true podcast audio <laughs> form, <laughs> but um, I started listening to them too, because that's easier. A lot of times, you know, just play it when I'm driving around town and every single lesson I would listen to, I would think, Oh my gosh, why didn't I know that? Like, how could I take 30 <laughs> years and not know that? That is such a great idea. I mean, it happened over and over. And you know this, Angela, because a lot of times I would call you or, you know, we use Voxer and I would message you and say, oh, my God, that's a great <laughs> lesson. And so I guess my message to the people here is, OK, this is amazing. Like um, one teacher, Heather said, this was such a great webinar, but it was her first one and she's spoiled for anything else. <laughs> and I think a lot of people feel like, wow, this is awesome. But what I'm trying to say is what if you could get this kind of awesome support 52 weeks, like every Saturday morning, you get an email with a PDF, all these printables and things, but you also get the audio version so you can listen to it. And then you have this Facebook group that you can go to, which I would say is the best Facebook group I've ever been in, the elementary one. I'm not in the secondary one. I'm sure it's great too, but people are so supportive and mm -hmm. it just makes, I, I can guarantee you there are people who stayed in the profession that would have probably quit by now because they didn't, they were doing what I was doing, but they just burned out. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have more of the stories that I read in that Facebook group about um, how I was finally able to get home on time to have dinner with my family. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, it just about makes me cry when I read I some stories <laughs> in a good way, but yeah. also in a bad way, because like, think of all the years they wasted. So if anybody's sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, 119 is a lot of money. I want you to just measure it against the change that could come about from enrolling in this club. And I think you will say that it is totally worth it. And when you read the reviews, that's exactly what you'll see. Anyways, I'm going to go over to um, the page. Um, did I show my screen yet? No. Oh, well, that would have oh, been yeah. nice. Yes, you did. I'm sorry, you did. It was just the same slide I had. <laughs> so I didn't realize. Yeah, oh, you're okay. sure. All right, so I'm showing, whoop, now I paused it, didn't I? No, it still looks good. That's weird. Okay, I'm trying to um, get back to where I can advance it to the next um, screen, and, and it's not working for me here, so there we go. Okay, so anyways, I wanted to tell um, the teachers about this offer before we go over to that page and kind of explain it a little bit. So I am so gung-ho about the 40-Hour Teacher Workweek Club that I really feel like any teacher could benefit from it. But I know that 119 all at once is, you know, that's kind of difficult to think of doing. But mm -hmm. I also really believe that if you are going to be serious about making a change, it's like what you were saying, put some skin in the game, invest in yourself. Like you're going to save, what is it? I think like $20 over the course of the year by doing the one-time payment. I think the other one works out to be like one. 140 or something. So you're going to save money, but also you're sending yourself a message like I've paid for this and I need to do mm -hmm. this. And I just think that's so important that I'm going to sort of sweeten the deal a little bit by saying I've got these four bundles that they're all valued between 20 and $30 of just great resources. I tried to pick a variety of things. And if someone um, purchases there's like a process I'd like you to click on um, as I'm an affiliate of the program. I, I should, you know, reveal that even though it's probably pretty obvious, but um, <laughs> I just totally believe in it, but I would like you to click there. And when I show you how to get to that page and look at the bundles. And if, you know, if you think this program is right for you, I'd say go for the full one-time payment. And if you're willing to do that, I will let you choose one of these bundles and you fill out a little form. And I'm going to um, go over to that page right now myself. Um, I'm going to see if I click on the link that I put in the chat myself. And hopefully that will open up. So you'll end up on this page. Can you see that? I'm not seeing it on my, um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at my computer on another screen and I'm not seeing it switch. Are you guys seeing where I went over to a new page? Nope. Okay. So let me um, do this. I think it paused. All right. Let's see if it updates. There, there we, we go. go. I think what it did was it just got stuck on that slide. 
and I had paused it, but that's okay. Anyway, so you'll end up over here um, on this page that shows the, the bundles here. It kind of explains what to do. I also wanted to let everyone know that there's a lot of links available and you had mentioned some things, you know, reviews you can read. Well, <clears throat> Angela, you've also put together this quiz that, you know, I've seen questions like, is this right for a kindergarten teacher? Well, I suggest that they click this link here, take this quiz. I know you put a lot of work into trying to come up with tools to help people decide if it's the right thing for them. There's mm -hmm. also like group licensing for schools and, you know, people can purchase with purchase orders. There's so much information here. And the other thing I wanted to mention is if you're still like thinking about it, you think this sounds really good, but I would really like to talk to people who are already in the group. I have a Facebook group called Teachers Working Smarter that there are members from the group. Now, Angela is banned from the group. <laughs> and she knows why, because I want people to feel totally comfortable to ask whatever they want to ask about it. So there's information there about how you can join uh, that group. And then there's some uh, freebies and resources that go with this webinar. There's actually a certificate of completion they can get. And it kind of explains about, you know, you might be able to get PD credit for this webinar, but you can certainly try. There's the um, note taking handouts link and so on. But anyways, um, I just wanted to go ahead and put that forth so that um, before people made purchases, they could kind of think about if that's something they would like to do. And they, they, they would know exactly what to do to um, claim one of those bundles. So I think at this point, we um, see what questions there are that people have about the content or the course. I will say a question came up today that I remember hearing yesterday. I believe yesterday somebody wanted to know that was on that slide about when you're saying um, yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And it really sparked a lot of thought in people like, well, how do I say no to my principal? Or like, my principal really believes in me. He or she is really confident and he ends up asking me to do a lot of things because he knows I'm going to do it right. And like, I just don't know how to say no. And, and I remember you talked about that yet, uh, last night. Was that in response to a question that had come up? Seems like it was. Yeah, I think so. Did you want did you want me yeah, to talk about that part? You didn't address that this time, did you? I was kind of trying to think. Mm -hmm. did you? Okay. Yeah, I, I would like to. That was, and I think a lot of people, I know I felt that way. I got asked to do so much and I didn't know how to say no without feeling like somehow I was letting somebody down, but really I was letting myself down by mm. not knowing how to say no. So yeah, I would love for you to address that. You had a good answer for it last night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's this idea of, um, you know, saying no to extracurricular activities that are just too much. Um, and I think that's really about setting intentions and being clear about where you can offer the most value. So you don't have to say yes to something just because they need a warm body. Look for the things that you can contribute that are meaningful to you so that they don't feel like such a chore and that you actually get something back in return. So, you know, tell your team or tell your administration, okay, I can dedicate two hours a week to extracurriculars. Where do you need me the most? I feel like my strengths are X, Y, and Z. Where should I be in order to create the biggest benefit for kids? So it doesn't come off that way like you're not a team player or you're lazy. It's just that you're clear about making sure that the things you say yes to are going to have the maximum benefit for the most number of people. And I think how well that is received will depend on your approach, because if you have this attitude, well, I'm not doing that, you know, this is my, this is my boundary and that's it, this is all I'm doing, then yeah, I think you might find some repercussions. But if you are positive and you're genuinely wanting to be helpful and you're expressing your limitations and your strengths really clearly, I think most of the time, most people will respect that. So, you know, if you're not, if you're a little hesitant on this, I encourage you to try it, you know, try it out, even if you're a little nervous about it see how it goes and just you know let people know you're trying to be intentional with your time you want to pick things that are the best and highest use of your time so let's think about something that really utilizes your strengths thanks i think that's really helpful and the way you kind of spin it in a positive way like thinking about what your strengths are and putting it mm -hmm. forward you know that um you know you can have this much time how you know i, I mean i just i like the way you said that. i think it'll give people some ideas um, especially, you know, like we're in the summer now, but already I bet you principals and administrators are reaching out to their 
teachers that they're their go-to teachers mm -hmm. that they know whatever they give them to do, they're going to do it and they're going to do it well. So yep. already this summer, you think you're on vacation, but you're getting emails from your principal <laughs> from next year asking you to head up this or that program. So, you know, right here is where you just stop and you say, I need to move forward into this school year in a new way and not start off with this thing where I'm saying yes to everything except for me. You know, mm -hmm. I got to figure out how to say no to some other people's priorities so that I can have time not just, I mean, relaxing and everything's great, but I mean, literally your health, like it, your, you know, your health, you don't appreciate it sometimes until you lose it or mm -hmm. when you start to lose it. And when you don't have the ability to get outside and play with your kids or go do things and you think, I wish I could do that, but I'm just not healthy enough to do that. You start to really value it and you just realize like, why am I giving my whole life to this career and doing everything for everybody else but yet somehow i'm you know i'm sacrificing my own ability to get joy out of life that that shouldn't happen and i don't think there's many administrators that would expect that of you and certainly they're not doing it themselves <laughs> they may mm -hmm. contribute a lot but they often ask more i think sometimes but you know if you have an administrator that really leads by example and they do give a lot, it can be difficult to say no, but that doesn't mean you have to, you know, sacrifice everything that's important to you. But anyways, I, I guess I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but you know, I get, <laughs> I get excited about this topic because I love the resources that you provide. And, and I was, as I was saying earlier, you've taught us how to create good habits, but the problem is if a teacher is like me and they don't really know what to do, your club week by week gives the little tidbits of information, the steps and the strategies. And now with this webinar, like they can take those new things and turn them into habit. So like, I just think this just makes your whole course even more powerful, this um, webinar that you've done. So I wanna say thanks. And I need to look to see if there's something else um, in the questions. And Peggy um, is with us, and I don't know, Peggy, feel free if you've seen something we haven't addressed. Um, I did see somebody had asked about like my bonus that I offered, like they're already a club member. And this is for this particular cohort. I do different things at different times. Um, if somebody has a question about it, they should just email me, you know, directly. But I will say like when you started out, the club cost was less. So, but it was because you've developed it so much more that there's really more value here. And as it continues to develop, you know, the cost will probably increase in the future. So if somebody wants it, they need to get it now because they'll have access, you know, I mean, we don't want to say unlimited because you never know, but you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. they will have, uh, how do you state it? Because you can't really say forever because nothing necessarily forever, but ongoing access for years and years to you know, to the club materials and so on. So um, anyways, let me see if there's anything else. Laura, let me just jump in for a quick yeah. second. Thanks, um, I compiled all of the questions that I saw and put them in the chat panel for the organizers. So maybe that will help you find them quickly. All right, let me just take a Great. look real quick here. And Angela, you remember how to get to that chat panel and go to yep. webinar there and... Um, See if I can, everything like closes up and then it, it's weird because you have to stretch it and take a look at it. Um, I see one about the school email address, you know, so I can't use a school email address. If you don't mind, I'd like to address that from just something I saw yesterday. I was in my um, constant contact email program and the last email that I sent out, I looked at the, the number of emails it bounced, which means people never even knew that I emailed them because it just bounced right off their server. There was 1,300 of mm -hmm. them that bounced. And when I looked through them, almost all of them were school email addresses. Yep. So the, it's not like it's Gmail and it's going to your promotions tab where you at least have a chance to go look at it. It's like your school filters things out and doesn't even let you, you know, have access. So I would say set up a special, um, I don't know about Gmail because Gmail is weird. Like if you law, if you already have Gmail, you know how it kind of messes with things when you have different Gmail addresses. But you know, get us a, a separate email address if you don't want to use your personal one. 
mm -hmm. you can use, but just make sure you're going to check it. Do you have anything else to add? About um, that? No, that's good. Do you want me to try to go through the rest of the questions as quickly sure. as I can? Sure. And we, okay. we really only have, let me just say one more thing, because, you know, I told you we, we want to end this um, by 630 at the latest, because you have another webinar to present at mm -hmm. 8. Um, so I just wanted to remind them that if some of these questions are not answered, um, please join the Teachers Working Smarter Facebook group and just ask me there. And if it's something I can't answer, then I'll um, check with Angela about it and I'll, you know, get the answer for you. So, okay, take a take okay, a shot and see what you can get through here in five minutes. Okay, so we have someone who said, I joined in January, but I haven't started using the resources yet. Can you download previous months? Yes, you can go back through anytime and you can actually download them all at once for the whole month. So on each month's page, like for the month of June, you can just click one link and you have all the PDFs for the month. One link, all the audio for the month. So feel free to do that. Um, what day of the week do the weekly resources come in on? Every Saturday. So the first set is released this Saturday, July 1st, and it continues throughout the year. So you have new stuff each week. Is the club not really good for special ed teachers? It's not designed for special ed teachers in the sense that, you know, you guys have really unique um, paperwork and data collection challenges that gen ed teachers don't have. And there's nothing in the club that um, addresses those specific things. But we have ton of special education teachers in the club. Um, one of our club moderators is a special education teacher. So she's there to help you adapt the ideas. I would recommend checking out the reviews page and you can filter it by keyword. Look for the special ed teachers there who have talked about how they use the club and how it's been helpful for them because we definitely have a lot in there. I want to um, just jump in on that one, too, because mm -hmm. the next one is about special ed. And in the um, Teachers Working Smarter Facebook group, this I've had this going for like a year. And that com has come up repeatedly. And I've mm -hmm. had some special ed teachers that have just given amazing testimonials about even it's not designed for special ed. And they realize that certain things don't apply. But there's so much about it that helps them that they have been able to, you know, they might not be down to 40 hours, but if they're working 70 hours and they're now doing 60, they're thrilled with that. So I just kind of want to throw that out too. Mm -hmm. um, so someone says, if we did a past session of the club, can we do the new sessions or do we need to pay again? So I'll never make you pay twice. That's not fair. I'm not going to make you pay $119 twice for basically the same thing. Um, what you want to do is you want to join the graduate program. So the graduate program is a fraction of the cost. And what that does is that gives you a plan for going back through the materials you already have. It gives you checklists and goals and it gives you the updated resources. And you get those for as many years as the club is active. So you pay a one-time fee with the graduate program, and then you can keep getting the updated resources um, for years to come. So you always have what the current members have. Um, all right, next one says, question about midday breaks. I like the idea of choosing habit ideas um, in the handouts with getting ideas of a place to start. The description, if you, fits me, like, you know, if you need a midday break, do this, but I don't know what habit to start to adjust it. Is there a list of habits of rest and self-care? Laura, did you say you were putting something like that together? Yeah. That is something I have not done, but okay. it's kind of on my to-do list. I, awesome. I feel like it's needed too, and I want to put that on this page that we're looking at right now, and I'll also you know, put it in the Teachers Working Smarter group and try to get it out to people when I get it together. And if anybody has any ideas they want me to add to the list, just put it right there in the question box because I'm going to download all of that and look through those and add them to the to the master list. Okay, awesome. Well, there's only a couple of questions left, actually. I think we'll get to all of them. Um, one person said, I teach fifth grade in a middle school. So would I be in the elementary or the secondary Facebook group? You could be in both, certainly, if you want to be in both, if you think that's applicable. Um, when do we get our completion certificate? That's right there on the link to the page. Um, Laura has that already ready for you, so you can click right over and get that. If you're talking about the completion certificate for the club, um, that's at the end of your year. So after you graduate, you get it. Sometimes teachers will email me and say, hey, I needed a couple weeks early um, to give to my district before the school year ends. That's not a problem at all. Um, and then uh, there's two questions. These will be for Laura. One is, if I'm already a member of the club, can I still get this bonus? And if I'm already a member of the club, can I join the Working Smarter Facebook group? Okay. Um, I think I had addressed a few minutes ago about the, you know, the bonus. They need to just email me, but really this bonus is just for this particular cohort 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, from different things are offered, <laughs> different um, club openings, but they can certainly just uh, reply to the email that went out earlier and email me if they have questions. And then um, the last one, oh, yes, I love having people from the club in the Teachers Working Smarter to help me answer questions. It's really, really so important for people who, you know, think about spending $120 and they want to be able to talk to somebody and get the real deal on what's, you know, on, on their situation. The quiz is there, that's good too, but it always helps to connect with people who are similar to you. So anyways, looks like we are done. Um, I don't know that I see um, anything else. The PD certificate or the, it's just called a certificate of completion. If you see my screen, there's a picture of it right there and it's on that um, same page. And I'm going to try to switch back to this slide right here, which is what I thought I was showing earlier and realized that my screen, you know, had sharing had been paused. But um, anyways, that's the page that you need to go to that has this offer. And I also sent out an email. Um, I just kind of uh, typed it up ahead of time and scheduled it to go out uh, like maybe 20 minutes ago that has this link in it. So I want to make sure that people could get to that page. So the certificate is actually there on that page, the certificate of completion. So let me um, just thank you again. And I wanna thank Peggy George for being with us behind the scenes. Um, Peggy, you captured a whole bunch of questions that I missed. I have trouble with that. <laughs> you're, you're an expert, you do such a great job. I overlooked a lot and I know um, Angela appreciated having them all there. We could kind of go through them. So thanks for that. that so easy, yes. Yeah, and Angela, thanks so much for your inspiration, the motivation that you provide, you know, just the resources. And I would ask, you know, suggest that even if the course isn't right for you, that's fine, like, but go to Angela's site, um, go to, you know, download her Truth For Teachers podcast, listen, check out her resources, her inspiration, like there's so much free um, inspiration and motivation that can be found on her site and on her Facebook page. And then maybe at some point in the future, the club will be right for you or maybe not, but, um, you know, we, we both appreciate you attending the webinar and uh, sticking with us. So Angela, did you have any last words before we close out? I think that's it, Laura. I just really appreciate you giving me this chance to talk to teachers. I think we're both really passionate about this. It's really exciting to me to, to feel your support and to feel your enthusiasm and um, to know that you believe in this program so strongly. It just, it really means a lot to me because you have been there with me since before this was created when I, you know, was just you know, messaging you on Boxer, like, hey, Laura, I have this idea. <laughs> I'm thinking about I creating this thing for teachers. Like, I don't know if it should be a book, but if it's a book, it's gonna be like a thousand pages and they're not gonna be able to take action on it because it's overwhelming. Yeah. I think I have to like do this like over the course of, of several weeks, like a, like a club or something. And you were one of the foundational people who helped me figure out what this would look like and put it into place. And you have spent hours helping me brainstorm and, you know, figuring out solutions when we ran into trouble and you have been so invested in seeing teachers lives transform through the club and I'm just so grateful for that um, to you as a friend because this is not something I could have ever done on my own and I feel like you have been so instrumental in helping me create this and to helping it be the success that it is because you know teachers so well you are also another person who spends a lot of time listening to teachers and you're really tuned into their needs. And so having your feedback has just been awesome. So this is just a great partnership and I'm, I'm just really glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you for those words. And I will say, I don't, I don't think there's anything else that I'm an affiliate of like this that I just actively promote. Mm -hmm. And I want people to know that about me because I'm not, yes, an affiliate earns, you know, a commission on sales, but like, it's not, it's not about that for me, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I just want these materials to get out to teachers because I really see how transformative they can be. And I, I, I have many other projects of my own that I would be working on, you know, if it was just all about making money and it's just mm -hmm. not. Now for you, this is your livelihood now. So um, I would hope nobody would expect you to offer something like this for free. It takes a <laughs> whole team of, te of, of 
people, you know, a whole team keeping this going and it's very expensive to run the whole thing. So I'm sure that nobody at this point think, thinks it should be free. But um, thanks again, and we need to let you go so you can um, rest up your vocal cords and be ready <laughs> for the next presentation at 8 o'clock. So good luck with that, and thanks, everyone, for attending.